Let me start out by making a few comments about bad faith, kind of continuing from our discussion last time. So on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, a couple of days ago, we had a big discussion about um, Sartre's, uh, well, the selection from being in nothingness on bad faith, which is quite a famous passage or section. It's five or eight or ten pages long, something like that. Um, we had a big discussion about that. We're going to continue that next time, okay? So be sure to bring with you that reading next time, as well as bringing and having read Sartre's book, Anti-Semite and Jew, which is the reading for next time. It's, um, it's, it's kind of a short, it's a short book, um, and not difficult to read particularly, but there's a lot in it, and it's important and so on. So let me ask that you bring both of those to next week's discussion on Wednesday, okay? So, I'd like to, tr I'm going to try to say a few more things about the idea of bad faith before we start on today's topic. Um, okay. Uh, basically, of course, Bad faith is, is pretending that your freedom is not linked to the world. I think that's a fair way to characterize the idea here. In other words, it's, it's the effort to avoid responsibility. Now, responsibility means that A, means at least two things, right? It's a combination of two different things which is one, that you have the freedom to act in all sorts of different ways, right? And therefore, it's not something that's imposed on you or you have to do, but also that your freedom matters. That is, you do something and it affects other people, or it affects the world, or it creates who you are, or something like that, right? And so, when we talk about human responsibility, uh, there is this... That, that concept kind of captures the two-sidedness of human existence that Sartre talks about. That is, that we are both a thing in the world, you know, here we are, and it's all there, as well as the freedom to do stuff with it. Or to put it differently, we're living creatures. We are alive in a meaningful sense of that word, not just happening to do stuff because it's all biologically programmed, but because we're, we can have direction and choice and things of that sort, okay? So bad faith um, is this phenomenon that can occur because we're that kind of creature, that kind of being, you might say, all right? All right, that's, that's okay, but this is important for this course because... You know what a universal joint is? Have any idea? All right, you look when you you're driving down the freeway and there's a truck, and underneath the truck you see a kind of a drive shaft, and there's this thing in the middle of it that's got two different parts. One part can go this way, and the other can go this way, and they're linked, right? And it connects the the engine to the drive shaft. And it connects it in a way that here's this long, hard thing here, and here's this long, hard thing. And they join, and they don't break because there's this universal joint. That's what that thing is called. All right? So it allows for a quite firm but very flexible connection between two things. All right? So bad faith, I'm just working on this, uh, is this kind of universal joint between an individual person and the social world, all right? Um, it's kind of like this psychological phenomenon, is another way to think of it, um, that allows us, as free and responsible human beings, to gear into a social world where we don't always get what we want. All right? It allows us to connect to the world through these kind of, we've talked about typified patterns of behavior, 
like I'm a teacher, you're students. Right? They're these categories of behavior that allow us to deal with each other, even though kind of maybe inside my head, I know there's this vast array of exciting possibilities for me. But really, if I'm going to deal with you folks or anybody else, I've kind of, my vast array of possibilities have to be channeled down certain relatively predictable paths that we call social roles. Bless you. Right? And bad faith is this kind of psychological thing that I think kind of allows me to live with that. Or allows anyone to live with the fact that, yeah, I'm free, I'm responsible, but I'm not all that responsible. <laughs> all right? So you can, for instance, be involved in doing stuff with other people and it's not really what you want to do or it maybe doesn't feel right or you don't like the way it turns out or whatever, but you can kind of accommodate that in your own psyche through this thing called bad faith. That is, I can pretend, well, I'm not really responsible for the way things have worked out and for what's happening. Okay? So, I don't have this theory all worked out, obviously, but I think it's something like that that's going on, is that bad faith operates right at that nexus, like social role, between the ostensibly free individual and the fact that we live in a society where we got to deal with other people and things don't always turn out the way we like, and so on. Okay, so it helps us figure out how we gear into the social world, generally speaking. Now, Berger and Luckman, who, whose book we're going to read near the end of the semester, know this and talk about it. Okay? They've got a little section about bad faith in their book, but it's not nearly as good as what we're doing. I'm just telling you. And we're, we're getting much more complicated about it than they do. But, but other sociologists have certainly recognized that this is a thing to account for. All right. All right. Now, here's another thought before you read next mm -hmm. week's reading. Bad faith... Um, exists not only with regard to yourself, to thinking about, um, uh, you know, well, don't blame me for what I did. I was just following orders. Okay, that's applying it to yourself. You can also apply it to other people. Right? And that's what Sartre's going to describe in Anti Semite and Jew. What that book is about, and Sartre wrote it in. Uh, 1946 maybe or 48 somewhere around there right after World War II and he was describing anti-semitism in France basically as he had seen it leading up to the war and during that period and so on. He's describing racism. Okay? That's the way to approach that book. It's not about the peculiarities of what was happening in France in 1944 or 46 or whatever. He's describing, in a sense, the psychology of the racist. That's what's going on. As you read that book, he's, he's trying to say, what's going on? How do these people see things? All right? Okay. Um, and I think you'll enjoy it. I mean, it's a really interesting, really powerful, good book, actually, in a lot of ways. Okay. So that's what we're doing for next time. Any questions about that or anything? All right, now I'll tell you today's lecture, last time's lecture was easy. That is, it was like, okay, bad faith, and then a whole ton of examples. This time is tougher for me, I'm saying. So I'm going to be looking up, looking down, not knowing what's going on. <coughs> Don't be surprised by that. Um, so a bunch of different ideas and a whole bunch of I think, cool examples of something. So I'm not always sure what it's an example of, but, you know, one step at a time, right? Um, but I think you'll see as we go along. But I can tell you what, the, what, what it's about. Well, it's mostly about the phrase there on number two, which is, I am my others. It's about the way in which we are inseparable from the people around us, okay? which is a topic we've brought up before, but here we'll really get into some of the details of, I think, how that works and what it means. But first, 
part one, the self. Okay, now, eminence and transcendence, as you see here on the outline, uh, those are not particularly special or technical terms. We're just using them for right now to kind of give a certain idea, but you'll see. Okay, so I would say first, the self, we know a lot of things about the self so far. We've talked about it a lot of ways. Uh, but we could say, to take a sort of different slice at it, that the self, okay, who I am, um, has features of both imminence and transcendence. Okay, now by, we'll go transcendence first. Oh, we'll go imminence first. Okay, so imminence, I am a, okay, it's not, <laughs> there are a lot of different words here that are spelled. So. There's imminent. That's what we're talking about today, right? That's not the same as imminent, which means like it's just about to happen. And it's not the same as eminent, which is like, you know, so-and-so is a big shot. Right? He's eminent. Eminent right? is a term that usually gets used only in philosophy or religious writings, actually. But it refers to the idea that certain things are uh, imminent, are um, kind of built in to what is in front of you. All right? Uh, example from religious thinking might be that God is imminent in all of us. <coughs> that is, if God exists anywhere, it's within each of us. That's imminence. All right, so the very life of a human being is some expression of God. That's, that's an example of what's called imminence, <coughs> which is what we're talking about right now, okay? So, the self has imminence, which I'll speak to in a minute. Oh, I got these backwards on this, didn't I? I said, you know, some transcendence. Well, let's go, with, let's go with eminence first. Okay, so eminence means that, for instance, the self is carried with me all the time. And, and what I do kind of testifies to who I am. You might say automatically. All right? I don't have to add anything on. Um, for inst and, and, and in all sorts of funny ways. For instance, um, I'm a southerner. Okay, I grew up in Tennessee. Haven't lived there in 30... Oh, wow. Maybe 40 years, actually. I left Chattanooga in 1971. Okay, so I haven't been there in 40 years. And yet, I still kind of carry that with me. <laughs> right? And you can hear little bits of a southern accent sometimes when I talk, maybe. Is it obvious or not? It's a little odd. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you ain't heard nothing. <laughs> I mean, when I'm down, you should see here. I come back from vacation if I'm down there sometime. I'm coming, hey, how y'all doing? Oh, man, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, I kind of carry Tennessee with me in certain ways, right? It's just as I kind of carry a bit of Florida with me because I lived there for a while and it, it's sort of still kind of here, right? By the same token, I carry my past around with me all the time. We talked before about how um, your body carries the past with you. So if you <laughs> reach a certain age, it becomes kind of obvious. So, you know, you got a bad knee because, you know, when you were swimming as a kid, you kind of did too much breaststroke. And, or, you know, uh, or, uh, you know I, I, I tend to slouch forward this way because I broke my back, actually, when I was a kid. Um, uh, or, um, you know, you might have different scars on your body or you, you smile in a funny way because you were in some accident when you were a kid, you know, messed up the muscles a little bit. I don't know what, right? Everybody's got all this, so you're, you're carrying that. But you're also carrying your past with me, with you as, um, uh, in different forms. So it can be sort of the foundation of who you are. Uh, it can be a burden. You know, you meet certain people and you realize like, oh, that person, they've had a hard life. Right? You can tell. <laughs> You can tell. Even though physically, there they are, right? They could be anything or do whatever they want, but they're kind of bowed down by what's happened to them. Stuff's been bad. And they have, they have funny reactions to things. You know, they tend to get offended easily or something because they're carrying something about their past. with, And that past is not 20 years ago. It's imminent. It's with them right now. 
That's what we mean by that. And the same is true of your future, of course. We've talked about that any number of times, that you, you're living right now towards a certain future. And we can see it by the way you're sitting here and the attitude you have towards school and the fact that you're in the room right now rather than off doing something else. Okay, All of that is an imminent statement about your future. And it's not that the future is some thing that makes this happen, right? You're living towards it, is what we might say. Okay? All right, so, uh, so there's Im the self has this characteristic of imminence of all this stuff that you carry with you that's visible almost at the present with you. It also has this characteristic of transcendence that we've talked about, which is kind of the other way of thinking about it. So, so um, um, transcendence, again, it's kind of a religious term or philosophical term that just means um, going beyond is what it literally means. To transcend something is to go above and beyond it, you might say, that um, kind of outside what is right here, right now. All right? So, um, so uh, you might say, I transcend myself right here in the sense that I sort of exist in Tennessee. All right? So my brother, he lives down there with his kids and stuff, and, and they live, and I, I'm not saying I have a big impact, you understand? But, you know, there's a kind of a little bit of me in Tennessee right now in the lives of my family and friends who are down there. All right? Um, um, yeah, okay. All right, so I think that all kind of makes sense. So that is kind of another way of slicing stuff that we've already talked about, about the, the self as both thing and freedom and so on. All right? No big news there. But here's the big news today, is part of that in and out, you know, the transcendence, imminence thing, is I'm connected to other people. Okay, here's the big way I'm connected to other people. Let's put it in a slogan and say, just as the, the <coughs> bold statement of it, I am my others. Okay, what I mean by that is I am the other people who have surrounded me during my life. Okay? Now, that is totally contrary, antithetical to the way most Americans think about who they are. We all think we're individuals, you know, we're trying to be individuals and think that that's something good, for instance, uh, and think it's true, think it makes sense to talk about individual people as kind of isolated creatures going about their lives. I'm going to make the <coughs> argument that and that's not the case at all. I am sort of not exactly a product, although that works pretty well, but I'm... Um, yeah, well, let's, let's start with that. I'm the product of people who've been around me. For instance, in about, I got half a dozen different ways, at least. Number one, physically speaking, I was created by my parents. Without them, no me. Zip. Right? You're all familiar with this. This is like, your parents get divorced, and, uh, you know, they now hate each other or something. But, but, if I'd never met your father... I never would have had you. And you go, so, well, you know. <laughs> right? Okay, that kind of pros and cons here. But that works. So you were physically created by other people. And you physically are, in lots of ways, those other people. In all sorts of funny ways that come out. Like, so I'm getting older. So as your <clears throat> body starts deteriorating, what comes out are the, are the built-in weaknesses in your genetic makeup, right? So every two nights I get leg cramps because my dad used to always get leg cramps, right? And then it turns out my toes do funny things. My toes kind of move, like spontaneously. They go, I don't know. You've never dealt with this. You're young. This is good. Be young. Hold that. Right? So your toes kind of like this. I go, ah, I'm dying. So I go, <laughs> so I go to a neurologist who's a very nice guy. And he's, he, he starts pulling off my socks, and he starts laughing. He starts laughing before he gets my socks. Uh, I don't think it's funny. <laughs> he's like, oh, this isn't easy. He says, I know what you got. I'm like, what? I mean, you know, I got MS, you know, I got Lou Gehrig's disease. I got Parkinson's. I don't know. He, pull, he says, no, 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 you got, you got a genetic, what do you call it? You got a, uh, it wasn't genetic. He said it was a, uh, 
What's the word when you're born with something? Inherited. Uh, inherited. Inherited. Genetic. No, it's. Um, pardon? Congenital. Congen right. Right. You have a you have a congenital neuropathy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, but no, but I know enough medical stuff to know. I'm like, uh, oh, great, okay, neuropathy. That means nothing. That means my nerves are funny, like neurologically, a little funny. Uh, how bad is it? He says, laugh. He says, I can tell. He says, I pull off your socks. Your feet are cold. Feet are ice cold, even though it's middle of summer and you're wearing winter socks. And you got really, really skinny ankles. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> he, said, he said, he said, one of your parents had this, right? I'm like. You described my mom perfectly. She notorious her entire life. Really, really skinny ankles, could never gain weight in her lower leg. And her feet were always cold. Always cold. I'm like, wow, cool. So I felt a lot better. Felt kind of like bond with my mom. <laughs> right? But physically, I am my others, right? I'm I am my parents in lots of ways. And you don't notice it quite as much right now because you're young and vigorous and everything's working great. But as soon as the system starts, you know, going downhill a little bit, the things that characterize the weaknesses in your parents' body start showing up in your own. I could give you half a dozen other examples that I've, I got, okay, I got uh, gum disease. I mean, I don't actually because I'm really fanatic about flossing and stuff. But Dennis told me when I was 35 years old, he said, you're going to have gum disease, your father had it, your grandfather, your uncles all have blah, 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 here's what you need to do. Sure enough, I hit 45, my teeth like, ah! <laughs> Dennis says, you got gum disease. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> right? I was told this, that it would happen, right? So they're all kind of, okay, I am my others. Physically speaking, that's a big chunk of who we are, right? Second, second, I am my others in the sense that I'm socialized. Now, socialized in sociology doesn't mean like I go to parties, right? It, it refers to the idea that I've been taught how to behave in lots of ways, socialized. I'm brought into society in all kind of detailed ways. For instance, the way I stand, uh, okay, um, the way I walk, the way I lie down. So some years back, I'm, uh, well, okay, I'll tell you. My mother used to uh, lie on the sofa when she took a nap. She would lie on the sofa and do this. Have her hands kind of crossed. Like, oh, right. It's a little odd. A couple of years ago, you know, I'm lying on a sofa somewhere, I wake up, I'm like, oh. right, I'm in the same position as my mom. Well, that's sort of strange, right? But I sort of picked that up. It wasn't conscious, it wasn't like I decided to do that. That's not the case at all. If you look, uh, when I look at these videos, it cracks me up because um, uh -huh, I act like my brother Alex a lot. I mean, a lot. And I think he's a weird guy, you know, like I, <laughs> uh, what I just did, okay, you, you laugh and I hear like, I don't know why this thing, okay, he, that's him. And I watch him and I see, this guy, this guy's some funky mannerisms, this guy. And then I see on these videos, I'm like, jeez, please, I'm doing the same thing. I think, I picked it up from Alex. Well, I don't know, maybe he got it from me. You see? But in a family, you pick all that stuff up from each other all the time. And hilarity. Y'all, I love graduation at Hamilton for various reasons. But right now, you all look like individuals. But when you show up for graduation, when you graduate, there's this, this nice uh, picnic afterwards under these tents. And uh, everybody's sitting with their family. It's a riot. Because you walk around and you see like, oh, Mike, he just acts like all the other Kendalls. <laughs> you know, you see people and they look like their relatives. Their brothers and sisters and aunts, and they act like them. It's like, oh, look, there are like six of them. It's hilarious. <laughs> you know? Because we really do. We really do. You pick all that stuff up from other people. Or, um, yeah, sh uh, tell jokes like Homa. Uh, I, when I, some of the way I tell jokes comes from my brother Alex. Some of it comes from a professor I had in college who would tell jokes. And, and then he, I forget exactly what it was he would do, but he, would, he was like, hmm. He kind of leaned forward and closed his eyes halfway like, oh, here's a really cool point. And I thought this guy was cool. Now, I wasn't consciously imitating him, you know. I found myself telling jokes kind of in that same, using those same gestures, right, because you see it and you think it's funny. Or uh, there's, a, a, there's a scene in a Woody Allen movie. Um, I think it's Take Them, no, it's um, 
play it again, Sam, actually, where he's getting ready to go out on a date, and he's walking around in a towel, and he's walking like this. <laughs> I catch myself doing this. <laughs> right. I don't ever remember thinking, I want to look like Woody Allen, <laughs> right? But there's something about that gesture or that way of moving that just sort of caught my attention or that you, you know, sort of imitate, right? You know people, you find yourself moving in the same way as other people. So um, you, you are your others in that sense, right? Okay. Third, I am my others in the sense of having a shared history with various people. So there are generations of people, like people, my generation, you know, there's the Vietnam thing and who went to Vietnam and who didn't and where, you know, politically and how that shaped their way of looking at the world and all that. That's all pretty, pretty um, easy. You folks, uh, uh, and certainly people a couple of years older than you, um, are going to be shaped probably for your whole lives by the fact that the economy went to hell in 2008. Um, it's a big issue for you and for people a couple of years older, like I say. And that's going to be there for the next 40 years. That in various ways you're going to carry that with you and you'll share that with those other people who had the same sort of experience, right? So I am my others in that sense. And in all sorts of cultural references you make. You grow up, um, uh, my wife and I played Trivial Pursuit with our kids a while back. And you ever play this game, you know? You know Trivial Pursuit? So, uh, and, uh, well, depending on which version, yeah. it comes out real, real different. <laughs> and we did it once, and uh, we made some sort of deal where our daughter Rebecca could do the Disney version. I don't know. I don't know. She never went to all those movies. I don't know how she knows this stuff. Disney movies I've never heard of. She knows all the minor characters. <laughs> and my wife and I, we're getting crushed, you know, where we thought we, we, thought we were smart. But there's, anyway, so different generations of people, different groups of people share things. So I am my others in that sense. Four, I, I am my others in the sense we've kind of mentioned before, and we'll get into a lot more uh, in the next week or, well, in the next couple of weeks, in that we are, the phrase I use, mutually implicative. That is, I can only be a sort of person with your cooperation. We've talked about this before, right? If I tell a joke and you don't laugh, I ain't funny. If I try to be nice and you think I'm being a jerk or making fun of you or being patronizing, I can't be nice, right, without your cooperation. Goffman's essay on face work that we read is about this also, right? That you give me my face. You allow me to be the person I want to be. I'm trying to pursue a line. If other people won't let me, I can't do it. Okay? So I am who I am only by virtue of the fact that other people allow it to happen. Number five, I am my others in the sense that I'm constantly acting in, uh, with the assumption of the cooperation of other people in all sorts of ways. I've given these examples before. I get in an automobile. I drive this um, Hyundai Sonata. Uh, I wouldn't have picked it, but uh, my father-in-law, God bless him, just gave us the car because he couldn't drive anymore. <coughs> so that's a good price, you know. So I'm happy. It kind of smells like cigars, kind of a lot, and the, you know the paint is kind of peeling off, and it's not really a great car, but it's a great car. What was the point of that? Oh, so I get in this car. I mean, I'll, I'm going to go 60 miles an hour in this thing. You know, I, go. I have no earthly idea who built this thing or where it came from. Somebody just handed me this thing, and I look and I go, yeah, I'll do that. And I trust that the wheels were actually bolted on. You know, they're not going to fall off. The, dry, the steering wheel doesn't come off you in your hands one day. Things like that. We talked about getting on an airplane, the idea of climbing in this, you know, aluminum tube, seven miles up in the sky, and like, wow, this is great. <laughs> this kind of thing. You figure people know what they're doing or getting in the cab. We've talked about all that. Uh, I, I fell about a year and a half ago. In the middle of winter, I slipped on the ice in the upper Millbank lot. I got out of my car. This is a horrible experience, actually. I, uh, well, horrible. 
let's not overdo it, but it was bad. Uh, and uh, I stepped on some black ice, you know, and I levitated like this. So I'm lying flat on my back, three feet up in the air, and then they drop me. I mean, that's the sensation. It's like, it's like lying flat, people holding you, they just go like this. And I went straight down, flat on, oh yeah, very bad, very bad. Couldn't move, right? I mean, I could move like, okay. This is still working. That's good. Hurt like a lot, <laughs> um, and I couldn't breathe from it. You know, knock the breath out. Um, at any rate, so Paul Hagstrom in the econ department was—I was talking to him when it happened. And he's like, "Oh, Jesus!" And uh, I've heard, he said, he gets down next to me. And I said, "This is bad." That's the first thing I said, actually. So he calls the EMTs. This is the point of the story. So the EMTs come. EMTs are—are are you an EMT? Yes. You weren't there, were you? No. I have no idea who was there. I mean, Paul was there. Uh, some kid, no offense, shows up. <laughs> and I'm like, please, God, I hope he knows what he's doing. <laughs> right? Because it's a, it's a dangerous situation. I'm not only in pain, uh, any, it hurts to move anything. And the implications are also not good. Right? So I've had a, I, when I told you when I was, a, when I was young, I cracked a vertebra in a diving accident. And this, you don't want to go there, right? It's just not good. So um, anyway, but I'm putting my, my, you know, oh, there's EMT, right? He's not going to do anything stupid. Uh, then there were two of them. Then there, you know, next thing you know, the ambulance shows up, the neck brace, the CAT scan, everything, right? Morphine. <laughs> <laughs> no, because no, I'm in the hospital and they start examining. They had a terrible time just getting my jacket off because everything was, I mean, it was bad. And the doctor like starts poking around. And I'm like, eh, 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 and all of a sudden, ah, and I blacked out. I nearly blacked out. Uh, I don't know what happened, but Professor Kelly, who was sitting there as well, Al Kelly said, he said, you, you probably terrified half the hospital because I let out a bloody murder scream. And that was when they hooked me up to the morning, and everything's fine after that. I mean, the vomiting, I don't know, who cares? Um, at any rate, you're kind of a, the point of this is that, you, you know, all the time we're living with this serious trust in other people. You know, that the cab driver's not going to take you off to some, you know, torture cellar or something. Like that. I don't know. I get in a cab with a stranger, right? I, I've just fallen, may have broken my neck or something, and you know, this college kid shows up and tells me what to do. I don't know. I guess he knows. Right? That's a lot of faith in other people. Finally, we're social. Finally, I am my others in the, in the following sense. We're social even when we're alone. So you're walking along and you stumble. Right? And you kind of look back and you're like, oh, right, right, right. Right? You kind of make noises like there's other people there. You know? You're apologizing or something of that sort. We're social when we're alone, too, in an in a even deeper sense than that, which is um, when you think. All right? So, thought, I don't mean visual thought, okay? But thought in the sense of manipulating symbols in your head, which is what we do all the time. Thought, in that sense, is internalized conversation. That's what it is. George Herbert Mead wrote all about this. Right? That, that when you think about things inside your head, what you're doing is imagining conversations you've had with people in the past. Maybe not the particular individuals. It gets to be a kind of generalized thing. But in other words, you can't think <coughs> in the way that we usually mean that term without having been with other people a lot and taking that inside your own head. So first you converse. So interaction is the first thing in that process, not the last. It's the first thing. Then you can start doing this. And you watch little kids, you know, two, three-year-olds, they start having imaginary friends and they start playing roles and they start imagining what it'd be like to be a different person, stuff like that. That's because they've been interacting with real people face-to-face -face since they were born. And then it becomes internalized. Then they can start manipulating it in various ways and so on. So in that sense, too, I am my others. Um, a couple other examples of this sort of thing. Um, it doesn't mean, it, it, this can be implicit. That is, you don't have to 
actually think about other people to be living, so to speak, with an awareness of them. Example. Uh, I was in graduate school. I had this friend named Barry who was a really smart guy, very interesting fellow. And Barry was an atheist. Okay? Like he was a proud atheist. He was very in he was a religious studies student, actually. But he said, I'm an atheist. And he had all these great reasons for it, for why there was no such thing as God and so on. And one day, when he was about 30 years old, he realized that although he was an atheist, he had been living his life in the presence of God. By which I mean, by which he meant, he was living as if there were a God. Whatever he said. So he had all these great theories about why there couldn't be a God, and you know, that was a stupid idea, and science has long since proven stuff. He said, but he sort of realized, he said, oh my gosh, all these arguments I have don't matter because the fact is I've been living, the, if you watch my day-to-day -day life, I live as if there is a God. I believe in kind of ultimate justice. I sort of think somebody's watching, you know, what I do. I act as if there are kind of firm rules about right and wrong. I'm living in the presence of God, right? I'm living as, it's not even as if. Because his, my life, he was saying, is this kind of testament to the existence of God. And all my cheap talk is just cheap talk. You know, I, I've been writing all these papers in classes and stuff. Doesn't matter. I've always lived. Right? There it is. So there's my other without my having, even if I insist there's not another there. There it is. Okay? An interesting case. Okay. Uh, there's also this line from Les Mis, Les Miserables, you may have heard, which is, to love another person is to see the face of God. That's a, um, uh, well, I just leave you with that. All right. So, now, what the, the approach we've been taking in the course in the first half, right, uh, the approach of, let's call it existential phenomenology. That is, we're going to look at lived experience of actual human beings and try to understand how it's, sh what shape it takes, you might say. Okay, that existential phenomenology tells us, what we just got from Barry, that you don't have to prove this stuff. In a sense, it's just there. That's how we actually live. We live as if all of this stuff I've been saying is true. You don't have to work out the detailed arguments if you don't want to. Um, philosophers spent hundreds of years, you know, after Descartes especially, trying to prove the existence of the external world. Right? How do you know that what's out there, maybe this is just all images on a movie screen. Well, that's a cool idea. I mean, it's really fun to think about. Right? Like, what if this is just all my imagination? Okay? That's great. That's a legitimate thing for philosophers to discuss. But the fact is, if you look at any real, living, actual philosopher, none of them act as if that's the case. <laughs> they go and have lunch with people. Apparently in the belief that there's something more than a movie going on. Right? They get up in the morning and they, you know, say, good morning, dear. Like, you're not just a figment of my imagination, are you? <laughs> right? So the philosophy, the idea that there's an argument that has to be made, which is a fine argument, right, is something that exists sort of apart from their everyday lives. Does that make sense? you understand the idea there? Right. There's a famous example of this. Uh, the position, okay, the position in philosophy that questions the existence of the external world is called skepticism. Okay. So Bertrand Russell was a very famous philosopher. Uh, died in 1961, but he was very prominent from 1900 on. He lived a long, long time. Bertrand Russell, who wrote books for the public, uh, as well as technical books in math and philosophy, 
He got a letter once, because he used to correspond with all sorts of fans he had. He got a letter once from this lady who, uh, who sort of declared that she was a skeptic and thought the external world didn't exist. And she had this elaborate argument for this. It was really pretty sophisticated, you know, for a, for a non-professional. And Russell got this letter and read it. You know, she, she proves, you know, how there's no external world. Other people are just imagination and so on. So he didn't respond. <laughs> that was his answer to her question, right? All right, number three. <laughs> Think about it. Right? Be like, okay. <laughs> I mean, why write back? Huh? Okay, number three. Um, now, the the thing is, though, of course, I am my others in all these different ways, but. There are a lot of ways for us to pretend that that's not the case. Eh? Or to pretend that we're isolated and cut off and stuff. This is what bad faith is all about, if you're up on this stuff. A lot of different forms. You can pretend not to be involved. You can pretend that uh, your non-involvement is necessary. Okay? I can't help it. I don't have the time to deal with that right now. Uh, that issue is too big for me. Uh, uh, I'm too young to deal with that, mm, whatever it is, right? I mean, that's what, this is fascinating, by the way. So you folks are, are in college, right? Which is not the real world. Now, there's a great concept, isn't it? Like, it's sort of like, what I do doesn't actually count. Right? Well, this real world thing is very funny because um, when I was studying nurses years ago in the hospital, a lot of them use the same expression. They would talk about the real world, meaning stuff outside of the hospital. Right. And yet, I'm watching what they're doing, and I don't, it looks pretty darn real. All right. It was interesting. So I started thinking about this more. I was like, when, you know, grad, I went to grad school, and a lot of those, but we're just avoiding <laughs> the real world. Like, well, what does that mean? You know, there's this, again, it's a kind of bad faith, right, where you're pretending that what you do somehow isn't part of actual life. That's going to happen a little bit later, thank God. Okay? So that's, that's a form of bad faith as well, or a denial of uh, socialness that can take many forms. Um, another variant of that would be um, something that's real, you hear a lot from certain people right now, actually, is this idea, like, uh, you know, I did it all on my own, right? Whatever, I, I, easy example, right? I'm, you know, Michael Bloomberg, take my favorite example, actually, is, I mean, I'm just saying, you know, okay, so I don't know the man, all right? I got nothing against him. He's the mayor of New York City. Do you know who I mean? Yes. Y'all? Yes. Um, okay, Bloomberg, well, he was 16 last year, but he, he has $18 billion. Okay, that's how much... He's worth, as we say. That's eighteen thousand million dollars. Okay. Um, now there are, there are folks, you know, uh, I don't know if Mayor Bloomberg's one of them or not, right? Who would say, "Well, I did that on my own, right? I a self-made man is the term we use. I did it by, all by myself." Well, that's a real stretch, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's possible, I suppose, abstractly, but. No, it's not at all possible. He wasn't fixing bacon and eggs every morning for himself, you know, or building the road that he drove on, or teaching all the people in school who then went to work for him. You know, he didn't do all that by himself. Right? You can't do it all by yourself. Not at all. You're built in with other people all the time in lots of ways. Now, none of this to say is that bad faith is a bad thing. Right? There are all sorts of benefits to it, as we've talked about some. All right. But anyway, all right, so let me, let me reorient myself here a minute and see where I am in the lecture. The denial of sociality or socialness takes many forms. Okay. <clears throat> denial of my connection to other people, separation from other people, pretending that they aren't really fundamental to who I am, things like that. That's what we're talking about. All right, takes a bunch of forms. One is just simple bad faith. Another is this kind of bad faith that Sartre will talk about in Anti-Semite Jew, which is to pretend that other people aren't living, responsible, active creatures in their own right. Uh, 
for instance, uh, you know, not taking someone else's concerns seriously would be a simple example of that. Let me give you a more complicated example of it. Um, I had an uncle who recently passed away. He was two months short of being 100 years old, actually, at the time, which is too bad. I was, I was actually going to go down there for his birthday when I got to Tennessee. Uh, not that we were very close, actually. But, you know, was, I haven't own, known that many people who live to be 100. But my uncle um, traveled a lot right, from the time he was quite young. And in fact, he used to go around the world once a year. Okay? He, had, he was financially independent, let us say. And he could do this sort of thing. So for many years, he used to take a trip around the world every year. And he would come back with lots and lots of um, slides, you know, photographs. You know slides? Mm -hmm. okay. um, and reams of, plus he had these journals, these immense journals that he had cataloged and stacked up on these shelves in his house, you know, long, long, all the journals, you know, recording these travels he'd gone on. But what was interesting was that he had traveled around the world a bunch of times, but as far as I could tell, it had never affected him at all. Okay? He seemed to have, for instance, all of the same opinions and views about the world and life and stuff as he did in, you know, 1938. Right? He had never been touched by it. It was all just pictures on a screen, in a sense. He had gone, and he could tell you what these different places looked like and how these people acted and stuff. But it hadn't, it hadn't affected him. It hadn't touched him a bit. Right? It was all part of what Martin Buber calls the it world, where he wasn't seeing other people as actual living creatures. He was seeing them as kind of items that existed for him to go look at. You know, like things you pick up in a store and, oh, that novel. You put it back. <coughs> right? and I, nothing against my uncle, okay? He was always very nice to me. But he was just completely unmoved by anything that happened in the world. And nothing was going to touch. And, and he wrote, he wrote, law, he loved writing uh, essays for the local newspaper. For instance. And they were always these reminiscences of things from the 1920s, 1930s, you know, when he was growing up. And he had been just frozen in time. I mean, the man, that's the way things are supposed to be. That's the way it is. And nothing, again, nothing had ever touched him. It was kind of bizarre. Okay, a couple other examples that might give you a sense of what I'm trying to get at here. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> many, many years ago, um, many, many years ago, uh, I met somebody uh, who I was um, attracted to, I suppose is a way to start this. Um, and I saw her as quite beautiful. Right? So I go to my friend, John, who I'm still friends with on Facebook now, <laughs> and I say, John, how do, how do I win the love of a beautiful woman? And he said, quite wisely, he said, that's not the problem. He said, the problem is what do you do with it when you want it? I thought, oh, that kind of changes the perspective. But anyway, the point of this, though, was not that, was that I meet this woman, and uh, we get together and stuff, and it's great, and, and I fell in love with her, right? But here's the problem, in a sense. Having fallen in love with her, I discovered that she was no longer a beautiful woman. She was this particular person, you see? Right? In other words, a beautiful woman is this kind of object in the world, right? And one goes, wow, wouldn't that be great? I want one of those. <laughs> and then having gotten there, you discover that that's not the case, right? You can't have this thing because once you're there, it's not a thing anymore. It's this, I mean, there's this human being and so on, right? Um, which was kind of an interesting experience. And I suppose the flip side of that experience is something you see... Um, a lot, I think, and maybe this is unfair, okay? 
But I think, I think women are more susceptible to this, to what I'm going to describe than men, which is the notion that you meet someone and you fall in love, and then you say, okay, we'll get married, and that will lock it in, right? That then that person sort of has to stay in love with me. Right? But the problem, of course, is you can't, it, it doesn't work that way, because you can't possess love because it's not a possession. It's the freedom of the other person, is what you're talking about, right? The other person continue, has to continue to choose to love you, and there's no way, by definition, to lock that down. If you could not lock it down, I mean, what if, what if you could make somebody always love you? Then they wouldn't be loving, right? Okay. And in that, you see, again, this, this goes to Sartre's article about bad faith. That's kind of what he's talking about, is the, the idea of being able to possess a freedom, for instance. It just, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. One other um, little example here is um, there was um, a film star named Rita Hayworth back in the 1940s. Ever heard of Rita Hayworth? You know, World War II generation stuff, glamour, you know, sex bomb, or I don't, what do they call sex symbol? That's what they call it. Maybe they didn't even say that in those days. They said glamorous <coughs> movie star, you know, low cleavage, all that kind of thing. All right, so, and she was quite popular. Um, and she, she had a fairly active love life, let us say. But she once made the comment, somebody interviewed her, I forget where this happened, and she, she was famous especially for a movie called Gilda, in which she played this very alluring woman. And she, she said some years after this that she said, the problem in my life, and she was quite unhappy in life, actually. So the problem is men go to bed when they, you know, we get together. Men go to bed with Gilda, and they wake up with me. Right? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Wake up with me. <coughs> All right. Another final little example about this notion of, you know, the uh, sort of denying the reality of a human being, let's say, who's opposite you, um, is. That you get this in a simple form. Reading a book, so most of us, most of us most of the time read books as if a book is an object. Right? And there are these words here, and some of them are interesting, and some aren't, and some are better than others, and so on, right? But it, what's very rare is to read a book where you actually feel like the person is talking to you. Once in a while, you'll get that either because the author is really, really, really good, or because you're in the right frame of mind, or you're at a certain place in your life where you happen to pick up something you're like, oh my, this, you know, is speaking to me, right? But I will say, you can try to do that anyway, okay? You're not just a helpless creature in all this, right? You've got your freedom. You can decide how to see the book. You can pick up a book and try to hear it as a human being is kind of struggling to say something because, trust me, serious books take a lot of work. <laughs> right? it's not, they're not just dashing that thing off one afternoon or something. They're really putting a lot into trying to explain something to other people that they think is incredibly important. Not that they're always correct, that's not the point. But try, when you read a book, you can, you can try to open yourself to that book and say, try to hear this as a human being who somewhere once upon a time spent a lot of their life, you know, trying to explain something to somebody and see if you can, you can pick that up. So that we might call recognition, <coughs> right? The recognition of another person. That is, you, you try to see who they really are and, and cut through the social roles and, you know, the objectness and, you know, the Gilda part or the, you know, I, I'm not going to see this as a beautiful woman, I'm going to see this as this person and, you know, here's this human presence or something that's available to me. 
right? Now that's not, that kind of recognition doesn't, it's not the same as knowing someone well. It's not the same as having a lot of information about them. Like you just got a big file or dossier where, oh, well, I know all about them. It's, it can happen quite immediately in the short run, right? Like one day you're on the subway and you're sitting next to somebody and you start talking. The next thing you know, you're just, you know, caught up in sort of the living presence of what, of this person next to you. Which is, again, not the same as chatting on Facebook, for that matter. I, I'm good with Facebook. I like it a lot. But, and we'll talk more about this as we go on, face-to-face -face relationships have stuff that nothing can replicate. And it's the reality of the living person right there. It's, Hubert Dreyfus would say it's the risk involved. That is, you're putting yourself in jeopardy if you're physically with another person. You know, not just that they're going to bonk you over the head or something, but, you know, all sorts of stuff. They can make an ugly face, they can laugh, whatever. They can walk away. Right? That face-to-face -face relationships allow for the possibility of actually recognizing a living person with you. Not, like I say up here, not like, you know, I keep pulling out my wallet in this class, I've noticed. You know, you, you look at a dollar bill, take an easy thing. I mean, jeez, this poor guy, he's, that's a stone-faced character there. On the one dollar bill, George Washington, I mean, he looks pretty frozen, but he, I, I thought of him as monumental fatherdom of country. It's kind of what's being expressed there. Lincoln's somber resolve. Franklin's benign wisdom. Look at Franklin. What is, oh, you don't have Franklin's. Those are hundreds, aren't they? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. But, but if you see the picture, you'll get the idea that when they decided on the portraits they were putting on these various bills, there's a statement being made about, I'm this kind of person. That's what the person's doing in the portrait. All right? You can look at a, uh, Sartre wrote a great essay someplace called Official Portraits. Or he goes into this. What, what's being said in the official person, you know, benign, you know, leader? Is that what's going on? Uh, steadfast, something or other? All that kind of stuff. Hamilton, I don't know, does Hamilton have a yearbook anymore? Yeah. Still do that? Does it come out this year? It will. It will? Great. Are you working on it? Oh. <laughs> okay. Yearbook photos do this, right? People try to portray themselves in a certain way. And you pick the picture that you turn into the yearbook or something like, oh, oh that's me. Yeah, I'm fun-loving, you know, sociable type person. You can walk down the, the hallway in your dormitory and look at people put up pictures and stuff in front of their room. They do this? Bulletin boards? Of, and, and, yeah, and you get the idea. Oh, okay. People, college students who do this, let me guess. Uh, I think fun-loving is way up there as a model of what kind of person. Sociable. I got a lot of friends. That seems to be part of it. Uh, 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 you know, not too academic, maybe. Uh, well, I'm just guessing, right? I haven't, I haven't walked down the hall and dorm for a couple of months now. But you can do that, and you can see the kind of portrait people are trying to make of who they are. But so, um, what I what I was calling recognition is something like trying again, trying to see the living person behind all this stuff. Right? So, point of today's lecture is just sort of this. I am my others in all sorts of real deep as well as superficial ways. Um, and that in dealing with other people, you know, we do it through all these typified forms and, and kind of social roles and categories of various sorts and stuff. You know, but once in a while, um, you know, something might break through that where you actually encounter that's the term Sartre might use. Martin Buber talks about this a lot, actually. That's what I and Thou is all about, is being able to recognize the, the living person in front of you, trying to get past a lot of those, those categories and things. And that's, uh, that's kind of a special event, I guess. So, anyway, uh, Anti-Semite and Jew, which you'll read for next time, talks about people who basically refuse to do that, who basically refuse to deal with the human being who's opposite them. Okay? Have a good time with it. It's good book. It's good book. Take care.